Walter. We all know that being a friend of Walter is a good thing to be at this university, and I have benefited very much from that friendship, so I appreciate it. Um, I, I won a, a fellowship this summer in the competition on gender and sexuality for this paper, and it, it's not that this paper is not about gender and sexuality, because it is, but really mostly it has a lot to do with common sense. And um, this is a, a, the subject of Cleopatra is a subject on which most intelligent people are willing to abandon their common sense. Um, and this is something that has just frustrated me endlessly over the years. I teach a course in Cleopatra, which is offered next se semester for any of you who might be, you know, a little interested. Um, and um, the, the course is not so much about classics, but how a classical topic can get twisted and distorted. Um, and in the course of reading through the voluminous material on Cleopatra, I just never fail to be frustrated by how, wil how willing people are to just abandon reality um, in ways that people will not when they're talking about other classical topics. And so, um, particularly the last time I taught this course, I became increasingly frustrated with Plutarch as a source and thought that it was time that I tried to do something to sort of, um, I don't know, smack people in the face a bit to say that we really have to be very, very cautious in how we use our sources, particularly in a topic that is so tantalizing and so seductive. So that's the origin of this and I'm, I'm expecting that I will finally finish this project as I teach this course again next semester and um, I'm able to involve my students in the, in the process of thinking clearly, I hope, um, to, just, to, to iron out some of my own prejudices that I've developed over the years as well. So it's always good to bring new people to the material um, just to, um, to point out to yourself how much you've become inculcated in the nonsense of the field. And that sounds very negative, but that's how it is. Okay, so. Um, Plutarch's invention of Cleopatra, and the title is deliberate because I want to argue that, that um, the Cleopatra that we know is indeed an invention with all the meaning, possible meaning of that word of Plutarch's. Uh, it would probably be a challenge to find a person in the Western world, and perhaps the Eastern world too, who had not heard of Cleopatra. Everyone can tell you something. She was beautiful, she was learned, she wore thick black eyeliner. <laughs> Most people know Cleopatra via Shakespeare or Hollywood. She has been molded, finessed, sculpted, idealized, turned white, turned black, and turned every color in between. And I'm not joking when I say she was turned white. Vivian Lee played Cleopatra in a Hollywood movie and she did it in white face. I say that again, Vivian Lee did the movie in whiteface. Digest that for a while. Okay. <laughs> no one can ever get enough of Cleopatra. By my latest count last night, there are eight new books on Cleopatra in English this year alone, and the year isn't over yet. One of them was released just on November 1st and is already at number three on Amazon's sales list which is remarkable, and number four is the Kindle version of it. So I think that if you combine them, that would make it jump up. Um, unlike most scholarly monographs, books on Cleopatra sell out and actually go into paperback runs. As an enduring icon of popularity, Cleopatra is unrivaled. But what do we really know about Cleopatra? A number of pieces of scholarship over the past decade or two have attempted to strip Cleopatra of her Shakespearean drama and her Hollywood theatricality. These authors have tried to desensationalize her story and reduce her narrative to the story of a power-hungry monarch rather than that of a degenerate Eastern seductress. But this, in my opinion, does not go far enough. Because we're all so taken with Cleopatra, we are quite reckless in our approach to her. Classicists are generally extremely cautious in their use of ancient sources, sometimes to the point of saying or admitting that we cannot confirm anything about a particular topic. But when it comes to Cleopatra, we throw caution to the wind. So today my talk will not really be about Cleopatra, and I'm sorry if that's false advertising, but instead, I want to talk about Plutarch, a plain old boring Greek guy 
who is at the heart our, of our obsession about Cleopatra, and I might say, indeed, that the obsession is his fault. Sources on Cleopatra from the ancient world are few and far between. Cleopatra herself, as the ruler of a wealthy empire spread across the Mediterranean, engaged in active self-promotion, portraying herself in Egyptian art as a living deity, appearing in public in the guise of the goddess Isis, and staging elaborate ceremonies to promote herself. The attention she garnered made her the easy victim of the propaganda of her enemy, Octavian. Thus Cleopatra became a character, a character in Roman poetry. Uh, Propertius calls her the Regina Meritrix, the whore queen, and Horace calls her the Regina Dementis, the demented queen. Contemporary prose authors avoided any discussion of Cleopatra, except Cicero's pithy remark, Reginam Odi, I hate the queen, which is what we would expect from a man as conservative as he was. We do not have any Augustan historian's account of Octavian's conflict with Egypt, and this is probably no loss if we are interested in unbiased accounts. The poets Horace and Virgil give Cleopatra some credit for her gumption. Virgil, in essence, concedes that she was a dux, a leader, but within the realm of fiction, they were able to accomplish this while keeping their heads on their shoulders. The real history of, Cle of Cleopatra begins with Plutarch. Plutarch was a wealthy and well-educated Greek born in 44 of the Common Era. He was a prolific writer of a variety of essays and biographies. Much of his writing is on morality or ethics. And indeed, some people really consider him uh, more of a philosopher than anything else. Plutarch's lives, his most famous works, are not biographies in the modern sense, and they are certainly not history. Plutarch is very clear on this, writing in his Life of Alexander the Great, and I quote, for it is not histories that I am writing, but lives. It is Plutarch's intention to show the events that best illustrate the moral fiber of his subject, rather than what would be conventionally considered the person's most famous deeds. Plutarch believed that narrative history was for those involved in the process, that is to say, politicians, or at least people who wanted to learn from the mistakes of others. His own interest was in the individual characteristics of the figures he wrote about, not politics as a whole. Plutarch's primary interest was in men of great character, the Alexanders, the Greats, and the Julius Caesars is, <laughs> what would be the plural of that? <laughs> um, who, while not perfect human beings, achieved greatness through strength of character. And Plutarch did write on women. He wrote a, a, an essay called On the Virtues of Women. It's a very, very strange little piece, which I still can't really make heads or tails of. Um, anyway, Plutarch likewise felt a need to address those who felt short of virtue, preferably those who fell short in a disastrous way. And so this is his explanation of why he did this. And this is from his life of Demetrius. He says, the ancient Spartans would put compulsion upon their helots at the festivals to drink much unmixed wine and would then bring them to the public mess halls in order to show their young men what it was to be drunk. And though I do not think that perverting the perverting of some to secure the right of another is very humane or a good civil policy, when men have led reckless lives, perhaps it will not be much amiss for me to introduce a pair or two of them into my biographies. So I think we shall be more eager to observe and imitate the better lives if we are not left without narratives of the blameworthy and the bad. Okay. So he wants to hold up a couple of people as exemplars of bad behavior. <coughs> Get them drunk in public.